Shalom on the Sabbath day. Welcome to the Philadelphia Assemblies. Today is the eighth day of the month of Tishri of the year 5782 on the set apart calendar. Now, the reason, if you think again, this is one of the, this is the first video that you watch from the Philadelphia Assemblies, you're going to think, wow, how, is he, how are they already in Tishri or the seventh month? Well, it's because we go by the full moon as the new moon per Psalm 81 verse 3 and many other things in Scripture. If you really want to know how to understand that and uh, see at least why we do what we do, watch New Moon According to Scripture on Philadelphia Assemblies at YouTube.com. And if you want to know how we keep the calendar, watch Keeping the Calendar According to Scripture at Philadelphia assemblies at youtube.com so that's why we do that so again today is the eighth day of the seventh month the month of tishri and it's also the year 5782 and on the gregorian calendar today is the seventh day sabbath saturday and it is uh september the 17th 2022 on the gregorian calendar so that's where we are. We're going to continue our expository teaching on the Apocrypha book of 2 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, and this will be part 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 6, to, uh, chapter 6, not verse 6, chapter 6. So this is the second, the book, this book of 2 Maccabees, and this is chapter 6 of this part 2 is where we're at, okay? We're going to open in prayer as we always do, okay? And we're going to stand and face Jerusalem, the place where the Father, Yahuwah, chose to place His name there. Almighty Father, Yahuwah, again we thank You, Father, for the very breath of life and for all that You provide. Father, we ask that You would continue to support us in that way and keep give us that hedge of protection around us. We ask that you would heal the sick, Father, that you would give peace that passes all understanding to any that lost loved ones this last week, Father. We ask that you would comfort them through your Ruach. Father, again, we ask that you would send forth your spirit in an extra unction or anointing today, Father. And teach us what it is you'd have us to know. Father, give me the words to say as I expositorily teach your word. And again, Father, we ask for you to be with those that are that are out there that are in need in any way, Father, we ask that you would meet their needs and sustain them, Father. We again ask that you would give us the words to say and, Father, uh, give us a, a, a mind to understand. We ask it all in your precious Son, Yahushua's name. Amen. Part 2, Chapter 6, Verse 1. Now remember, the book of 2 Maccabees is really going over everything we read in the 1 Maccabees. Okay? It's not a different thing. It's giving more detail. Just like the book of Genesis in chapter 1 describes the creation and then it goes over it in more detail and tells you how He created man outside the garden and placed him in the garden and many other things. So this book is basically expounding on the first book. So get that in your understanding. But it's two different people that actually wrote, wrote these books. So it comes to kind of like the Gospels do. You get one Gospel, tells you one perspective, this is another in more detail. Okay, so here we go, verse 1. Not long after this. Now, what is he talking about? Well, Judas Maccabus and nine others got away, it had ran off into the wilderness, okay? And there was great numbers that had been killed. So. So not long after that event, watch part one and, and you'll get understand what I'm talking about. But not long after this, the king sent Athenian senator to compel the Yehudim, or the Jews, to forsake the Torah. We read that in part one and two of uh, first Matthews. Of their fathers and caused to live by the Torah of Elohim. So to cease, I'm sorry, to live from the word of Elohim. So they convinced the vast majority of the Yehudim or the Jews to, to 
to do away with the law, not or the Torah, not much different what happens today. And the vast majority are the same way now. Verse 2, and to also pollute the temple or the sanctuary that's in Jerusalem and call it the temple of Olympian Zeus. Okay? So again, they worshipped other Elohim in the temple. And to call the one in Gerzim the temple of Zeus, the friend of the of strangers. Okay? So they would say that Zeus was the friend to the world or to strangers. As did the people who dwelt in that place, as you see. They, they, they just taught the same traditions of the people that were around them. Verse 3. Harsh and utterly grievous was the onslaught of evil. Anytime you take away the Torah, the love of many grows cold. Matthew 24. For the temple was filled with debauchery and re reveling by the nations, okay, or the Gentiles, who dallied uh, or with harlots. All that men was hung around with harlots, okay and had intercourse with women within the sacred precincts. Okay, that precincts is the area around the temple. Okay, and besides, brought in things for sacrifices that were unfit. Now what's unfit for sacrifices? Well, any unclean thing, or that's not the best, or perfect. Okay, so they brought in sacrifices that were unfit. That was talking about Israelites, okay? That's not just talking about other nations, even though they allowed other nations into the temple at that time. It says the altar was covered with abominable things, unclean things, okay? Which were forbidden by the Torah. We know what's, you know, what's named out in the book of Numbers and, and Exodus and, and also in Leviticus chapter 11, things are unfit. A man could neither keep the Sabbath at that time, nor observe the feast of his father, nor so much as confess himself to be a, of the Yehudim, okay, or the tribe of Yehuda. Verse 7, on the monthly celebration of the king's birthday. Okay, so they were celebrating the, the king's birthday every month, the monthly celebration. Okay, and the Yehudim were taken under bitter constraint. They were under the bitter rule of the nations around them to partake of the sacrifices, to eat of things sacrificed to idols. I'm adding that. And when the feast of Dionysus, and I probably pronounced that right, came, they were compelled to walk in the in the procession in honor of Dionysus, not Dionysus, wearing wreaths of ivory. Now you can look all that up. That's very pagan tradition. That's why you know it's so pagan that. During the holidays, people hang up wreaths on their door. Look up wreaths and their origins, and you'll see that. And they wore, they were wearing wreaths of ivory. At the suggestion of Ptolemy, Tol a decree was issued to the neighboring Greek cities that they should adopt the same policies towards the Yehudim and make them partaker of the sacrifices. Again, offering things eating things sacrificed to idols. You can see why there was such a compulsion against that during Paul's time. Okay, And should slay those who did not choose to change over to Greek customs to leave the Torah and do the things, the commandments of men, the Greeks in this case. One could see, therefore, the misery that had come upon them. For example, two women were brought in for having circumcised, having circumcised their children or their sons. This is Ben here, okay? Obviously, it makes sense you wouldn't be circumcising the women. These women, they publicly paraded around the city with their babies hung on at their breasts, then hurled them down headlong from the wall, killed them. Okay, obviously killed their babies first. Others who had assembled in the caves nearby to observe the seventh day, or the Sabbath, secretly, were betrayed to Philip and were all burned together because their piety kept them from defending themselves to view, in view of their regard for that most holy or set-apart day. And they're talking about the Sabbath day. Now, do you understand why sometimes the Yehudim 
would, that are not, don't have the Messiah, would uh, think that some of the things that they read in their prophets were already fulfilled. You see, this is, you know, obviously here, you know, they were being pushed to not keep the Sabbath and to do all the customs of the other Greeks, which we read in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the other prophets. So I can see why they see those things as they do, even though incorrect. Verse 12, Now I urge those who read this book not to be depressed by such calamities. One that reads this, don't be depressed. But to recognize that these punishments were designed not to destroy, but to discipline our people. You know, and, and when we get in the last days here, and a lot of the things that are going to happen are to discipline the people. Okay? To give them an opportunity to repent before the end comes. Okay? In fact, not, in fact, not to let the infamous alone for long. Impious. I spelled that, I pronounced that wrong. Impious. Pious means to be very pious in keeping the law or anything, being pious. And then it, in this case, it's saying impious. Okay, so that they weren't keeping the law. Along, alone for long. But to punish them, the unpious, those that aren't doing the, keeping the Torah, them immediately is a sign of great kindness of the Most High to discipline His people. See, he, he, through all this, Israel was being disciplined even though they were being cut off. See, it was all for their own good so that, that those that were truly trying to keep the commandments could be re recovered at the first or second resurrection. Verse 14, For in the case of the other nations, Yahuwah waits patiently to punish them until they have reached the full measure of their sins. When's that going to be? At the Great Tribulation. Okay? That's when He's going to punish the other nations. And also Israel that has, is unrepentative, they'll be punished at that time too. But He does not deal in this way with us at this point in time. Okay? In order that He may not take vengeance on us afterward, so that they may repent now, so He doesn't have to take vengeance on them afterward. When our sins have reached their height. Okay? For this reason, or therefore, He never withdraws His mercy from us. Okay? Individually, He didn't ever do that. Though He disciplines us with calamities, He does not forsake His own people. That be whether they be Jew or Gentile. Okay? Or of the Yehudim or of the nations. At this time. Verse 17. I'm say, I added that. Verse 17, Let what we have said serve as a reminder we must go on briefly with the story. Because see, the Yehudim, just like everybody else, only part of them are the elect. Okay, Because the wicked ones, if they didn't repent, they're going to be judged at the last res resurrection just like that because there is no difference ultimately between the Yehudim and the nations. Okay? It's those that fear Him and keep His commandments that are Israel. You have to keep that in mind. Verse 18, Eleazar, okay, which obviously we know is one of, was the name of one of the sons of Aaron. Okay, so these names are inherited. One of the scribes in high position. A man now advised in age, advanced in age, not advised. So he's getting old and of noble presence was being forced to open his mouth to eat swine. They were poking it down his throat. Okay? Swine's flesh. Verse 19, But he welcoming death with honor. See, that we may all be forced to those kind of positions at some time too. We hope not, but very well could happen. <clears throat> but he welcomed death with honor rather than life with pollution. Went up to the rack of his own accord. Anybody knows what a rack is? That's where they would put you out on a thing and stretch you out. Okay? He went up to that and laid down just like Messiah walked up to the stutros to be offered of his own accord, spitting out the flesh, verse 20, as men ought to go who have the charge to refuse things that is not right to taste, even for the natural love of life. So how do you figure that ever could change? You know, this guy was willing to go 
to the grave not to be forced to eat swine's flesh. Okay? So obviously those things can never be changed according to our Messiah. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 19. Let that seek in. Keep reading that over. Every time you think something's done away with, read Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 19. Verse 21. Those who were in charge of that unlawful sacrifice took the man aside. Notice they called his death a sacrifice here. Okay? Took the man aside because of their long acquaintance with him and privately urged him to bring meat or food of his own, providing proper for him to use and pr pretend that he was eating the flesh of sacrificial meat, things sacrificed to idols. Okay? And pigs or swine was one of their main sacrifices, okay, which had been commanded by the king. Okay, hopefully that's not going to happen, but it could happen in our time too. So that by doing this, he might be saved from death, and and be treated kindly on account of his old friendship with them. Verse 23. But making a high resolve, in other words, he he strengthened his resolve to not do that, worthily of his years and the dignity of his old age and the gray hairs which he had reached with distinction. See, you can reach old age and have gray hair and still not have distinction. Distinction means being set apart again, being distinct from the rest. And his excellent life, even from childhood, he had done this. He had kept the, the Torah and made it an, an issue. Verse, and he says, and moreover, according to the holy or set apart Elohim given Torah, okay, that's what he's talking about here, he declared himself quickly, telling them to send him to Hades. This is equal, this is from a Greek text when they translated Hades, which goes back to the grave. That's what this is talking about, okay? Telling them to send him to the grave, okay? Not to everlasting fire, but to the grave. Verse 24, such pretense is not worthy of our time of life. In other words, to make a pretense, to eat things that he brought from home, to make it look like he was going along with them. He said such pretense is not worthy of our time of life when you're an elder like that. Because you're at the end of your life anyway. Why even bow down and try to uh, put these people at ease. He said, at least many of the young should suppose that Eleazar in his 90th year, oh, they didn't live that long back then, okay, has gone over to an alien religion. See, that's what he was afraid of, that his witness would tell the youth that he had left the worship of the true Elohim and started worshiping these other gods. That's why he wouldn't eat things sacrificed to idols. And that's why it's such a big deal with Paul in the, in the Paul writings. Verse 25. And through my pretense, for the sake of, a li of, sake of living a brief moment longer, in other words, putting on a pretense just to live a few minutes longer, he's 90 years old, he didn't think it was worth it at all. Okay? They should be led astray because of me, the youth, while I defile and disgrace my old age. That's how he looked at that. For even if the present, I should avoid the punishment of men, yet whether I live or die, I shall not escape the hands of the Almighty. See, that's what we need to keep in mind. No matter what somebody does to us in this age, it don't mean a thing. Especially if you're old. Okay? You, you've done lived your life. Father only promises three score and ten. And then if, we, by pure strength, we live longer, maybe 80, and in this case, even 90, he said, why would I betray my faith at this time and show such a poor example for the youth? Because he will not escape the hands of the Almighty at the resurrection. Verse 27, Therefore, by manfully giving up my life now, I will show myself worthy of my old age. That, he, that there was a reason why he lived this long. It was this witness. Of all the things he did, this witness was his greatest. Okay? And leave to, to the young a noble example of how to die a 
die a good death willingly and nobly for the revered and set apart right rulings or Torah. Okay? When he had said this, he went at once to the rack. And think about how horrible that death was. And he went at once. It's like the Messiah. You know, he went to there. This guy's not the Messiah, but he's living a worthy death. You know, Scripture says, by chance, a good man would lay down his life for his friend. This is what this man did. He was a good man. Verse 29, And those who a little before had acted toward him with good will and now charge to ill. So before that they treated him well, but now ill. Well, because the words he had uttered were in their opinion sheer madness about keeping the Torah. That was sheer madness. Sheer madness today to most. You know, you talk about keeping the Torah. Why would you do that? That's too difficult. You can't do it. You can do it. Okay? You can follow the Torah to the best of your understanding by faith. And that's what this man did here that laid down his life, Eleazar. Okay? Verse 30. When he was about to die under the blows, he groaned aloud and said, It is clear to Yahuwah in his holy or his set apart knowledge that though I might have been saved from death, if he would have just faked it, okay, I am enduring ter terrible sufferings in my body under this beating, but in my soul or in my inner man, or my mind, will, and emotion. I am glad to suffer these things because I fear Him or the Most High. That's who He fears. Verse 31. So in this way He died, leaving His death an example of nobility and a memorial of courage, not only to the young, but to the great body of His nation, the greater body of Israel. Okay? Chapter 7. It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and cords. See, people think they got things bad going on now. Yeah. You ain't seen nothing yet. Okay? You ain't seen nothing yet. In the, in the great tribulation, it'll even be worse than this. Okay? And it's, it's not even close to that now, people. Any of you think that we're in the great tribulation, you need to read this. Okay? to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. Chapter 2, verse 2. One of them, acting as their spokesman, said, What do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress or break the Torah of our Father, or the right rulings of our fathers. Verse 3. The king fell into a rage and gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated. Verse 4. These were heated immediately, and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out, and that they scalp him, and cut off his hands and feet, while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. Verse 5, when he was utterly helpless, in other words, when they had completed all these things, cut off his hands and all these things, and his feet, the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing, Okay, while he was still yet breathing, and to fry him in a pan. See, that's tribulation, folks, of what we've not suffered under blood. Some already have, and some have, are waiting for that to come. The smoke from the pan spread widely, but the brothers and their mother encouraged, the, encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, Yahuwah Elohim is watching over us and in truth has compassion on us, as Moses, or Moshe, declared in his song, we know what, about the song that Moses sang, which bore witness against the people to their faces. When he said, and he will have compassion on his servants, those the ones that love him and keep his commandments, he will have compassion on his servants. Verse 7, after the first brother had died in this way, same way the first one died, terribly they brought forward the second for the sport for their sport now they were going to make sport out of him have fun with him they tore off the skin of his head with the hair and asked him 
Will you eat rather than have your body punished limb by limb? Eight, he replied in the language of his fathers, which would have been Hebrew at this time, and said to them, No, therefore, he is turned under... No, he said, No, therefore, he in turn underwent tortures as the first had done. All of them had been cut apart and then fried in a pan, I'd assume. Verse 9, And when he was at his last breath, he said, You accursed wretch, you dismiss us from this present life, but the King of the universe will raise up to an everlasting renewal of life. See, they know that. They knew there was a resurrection of the dead. Sadducees didn't believe that, but you could see the Yehudim as a whole did. Because we have died for His right rulings or Torah. Verse 10, After Him, the third was the victim of their sport. When it was demanded, He quickly put out His, put out his tongue. In other words, when they told Him to spit out your tongue, He quickly did. And courageously stretched forth His hands and said nobly, I got these from the heaven or the shamayims, the heavens. And because of His right rulings, I disdained them, His hands and His tongue. He hated them. And from Him, I hope to get them back again in the resurrection. Verse 12, As a result, the king himself and those with him were astonished at the young man's spirit or attitude. For he regarded his sufferings as nothing. Verse 13, When he too had died, they, they maltreated and tortured the, tortured the fourth in the same way. Verse 14, And when he was near death, he said, one cannot but cause, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of men and to cherish the hope that Elohim gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life, eternal life. That's what he said to the ones that killed and despitefully tortured him. Praise, praise you, Lord. Verse 15. Next they brought forward the fifth and maltreated him. But he looked at the king and said, Because you have authority among men, mortal, though you are, through you are, you though you are, I'm sorry, do what you please, but do not think that Elohim has forsaken his people. He did. As we know, Paul, Shaul said in Romans chapter 11, Okay. So we know that didn't happen. Keep on, Verse 17, he said, Keep on and see how his mighty power will torture you and your descendants. Exactly right. He said, Keep doing what you're doing and see what you get. Okay, verse 18, After him they brought forward the sixth. And when he was about to die, he said, Do not deceive yourselves in vain or for nothing. For we are suffering these things on our own account or willingly. Just like the Messiah ends up dying, they did it willingly. Because of our sins against our Elohim. Therefore, astounding things have happened. Verse 19. But do not think that you will go unpunished for having tried to, tried to, fl to fight against Elohim. In other words, don't think it's, you're going to get away with it. Verse 20. The mother was especially admi admirable and worthy of honor of an honorable memory. Though she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage because of her hope in Yahuwah. She encouraged each of them in the language of their fathers. Filled with a noble spirit, she fired her woman's, she, yeah, fired her woman's reasoning with a man's courage and said to them, I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. It's giving credit to the Most High. Third 24, Therefore the Creator of the world, Yahuwah, I added that, who shaped the beginning of man and devised the origin of all things, 
will in His mercy give life and breath back to you again, her sons. Since you now forget yourselves for, for the sake of, of, our, of His right rulings, His Torah. See, they forget themselves. They give up their own life willingly. Verse 24, Antiochus felt that he was being treated with contempt and he was suspicious of her reproachful tone. The youngest brother being still alive, Antiochus not only appealed to him in words, but promised with oaths that he would make him rich and enviable if he would turn from the ways of his fathers and that he would take him for his friend and entrust him with public affairs. Since the young man would not listen to him at all, the king called the mother to him and urged her to advise the youth to save himself. Verse 26, after much urging on his part, she undertook to persuade her son. But learning, leaning close to him, she spoke in her native tongue as follows. So she said, above or below her breath, she said to him, derived as follows, deriding the cruel tyrant. My son, have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb and nursed you for three years. Wow. And have reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you. I beg you, my child, to look at the, at the Shamiyim and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that Elohim did not make them out of things that existed. Wow. <laughs> Thus also mankind comes into being. Verse 29. Do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death so that in, Elohim, in, the, in Elohim's mercy I may get you back again with your brothers. So she knew that he would be cut off in this life, but he'd be cut off eternally if he gave in to the king Antiochus. Verse 30. While she was still speaking, the young man said, <coughs> What are you waiting for? I will not obey the king's command, but I obey the command of the Torah that was given to our fathers through Moses or Moshe. Verse 31. But you who have contrived all sorts of evil against the Hebrews will certainly not escape the hands of Elohim. Verse 32. For we are suffering because of our own sins. What they've done in the past as a nation. Okay? And if our living Yahuwah is angry for a little while to rebuke and discipline us, He will again be reconciled with His own servants, the ones that were His true servants, the elect of Israel. Verse 34, But you, un you unholy or unrighteous wretch, you must de you most defiled of all men do not be elated in vain for nothing and puffed up by un un uncertain hopes when you rise when you raise your hand against the the bend of the shamiim or the heavens you have not yet escaped the judgment of the almighty seeing elohim all seeing elohim or elohah singular Verse 36, For our brothers, after enduring a brief suffering, have drunk of ever-flowing ever life under the covenant of Elohim. But you, by the judgment of Elohim, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. Verse 37, I, like my brothers, give up my body and life for the Torah or the right rulings of our fathers, appealing to Elohim to show mercy soon to our nation and by afflictions and plagues to make you confess that He alone is Elohim. And, though, and through me and my brothers to bring to an end the wrath of the Almighty, or El Shaddai, which has greatly fallen on our whole nation. 39. The king fell into a rage and handled him worse than the others. How in the world could you do that? How could it be worse than the others? being exasperated at his scorn. So he died in his integrity, putting his whole trust in Yahuwah. 41. Last of all, the mother died after her sons. 
42, let this be enough then about the eating of sacrifices and the extreme tortures. See, a lot of people never read these books. So you don't understand why people were having such a problem with things sacrificed to idols. This is why. Okay, People gave up their lives willingly not to eat things sacrificed by, to idols. Verse 8. But Yehuda, Iscariot, Yehuda Maccabus, who was also called Maccabus, and his companions secretly entered into the villages and summoned their kinsmen and enlisted those who had continued in the, the, in the faith of the Yehudim. And so they gathered about 6,000 men. They besought, or they prayed to Yahuwah to look upon the people who were oppressed by all and have pity on the temple which had been profaned by the unrighteous men and to have mercy on the city which was being destroyed and about to be leveled to the ground. Now, that's happened several times. Jerusalem's been leveled to the ground because of the sins of the people. And it's going to happen again. Okay? The whole city is going to be leveled at one point. And to listen to the blood that cried out to him. Listen to the blood of these people and this mother that died for him. And to remember also the, the, the uh, lawlessness, the lawless destruction of the innocent babies that we talked about earlier that were hanging around the women's neck because they cir circumcised their babies on the eighth day, and the blasphemings committed against the, his name, okay? And to show his hatred of evil, verse 5. As soon as Maccabus got his army organized, the nations could not withstand him. For the anger of Yahuwah had turned to mercy, okay, on his people. It had turned to mercy. Coming without warning, he would set fire to towns and villages. He captured strategic portions. That's talking about Judas Maccabus, Yehuda Maccabus. And put to flight not a few of the enemy. Verse 7, he found the knights most advantageous. So in other words, he attacked at night when they couldn't see for such attacks. And, and talk of his valor spread everywhere. See, this is the rest of the story from... First Maccabus. You can see how detailed this is. Verse 8. And when Philip saw that the man was gaining was gaining around little by little, and that he was put pushing ahead with more frequent success, he wrote to Ptolemy, the governor of Colossia and Phoenicia, for aid to the king's government. And Ptolemy promptly <coughs> <coughs> appointed Nachon, Nach 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 the son of Patopolis, Patroclus, one of the king's chief friends, or best friends, and sent him in command of no fewer than 20,000 uh, Gentiles or people of the nations to wipe out the whole race of the Yehudim. He associated with him Gregorius, a general and a man of experience in military service. Verse 10, Nicanor determined to make up for the king the tribute due to the Romans, 2,000 talents by selling the captured of the Yehudim into slavery. And he immediately sent to the cities on the seacoast, inviting them to buy the the slaves of the Yehudim, and promising to hand over 90 slaves for a talent, not expecting the judge from the Almighty, or the, I'm sorry, the judgment from the Almighty that was about to overtake him. And he used Yehuda Maccabus and his men to do that. Verse 12, word came to Yehuda concerning Nicanor's envision and when he told his companions of the arrival of the army, verse 13, those who were cowardly and distrustful of, El, of, of the justice of Elohim ran off and got away. Verse 14, others sold all their remaining property and at, some, at the same time besought Yahuwah or begged or prayed to Yahuwah 
to rescue those who had been sold by the unrighteous Nicanor before he ever met them. If not for their own sake, yet for the sake of the covenants made with their fathers, and because he had came, called them by his set apart and glorious name. That's the Yehudim, okay, he's talking about. But Maccabus, but Maccabus gathered his men together to the number of 6,000 and exhorted them not to be frightened by the enemy. The enemy and not to fear the great multitude of the nations who were wickedly coming against them, but to fight nobly. Verse 17, keeping before their eyes the lawless outrage which the nations had committed against the set-apart place, which is the temple in, in, in Jerusalem, and the torture of the derided city, and besides the overthrow of their ancestral way of life. Verse 18, for they trusted to their arms and acts of daring. Okay? He said, in other words, the nations, they trusted their might, their arms and things of that nature. But we trusted in the Almighty El Shaddai, Elohim, who is able with a single nod to strike down those who are coming against us and even the whole world. He saw fit to do so. I edit if he saw fit to do so. Verse 19, Moreover, he told them of the times when help came to their ancestors, both the time of Sennacherib, when 185,000 perished, and the time of the battle with the Galatians that took place in Babylonia, when 8,000 in all went into the affair with 4,000 Macedonians in addition, in addition to 4,000 Macedonians, and when the Macedonians were hard pressed, the 8,000 by the help that came to them from the Shamayim, that means the 8,000 of the, the Yehudim, of that Judas, Yehudim Akibus was leading, so the, by the help that came to them from the Shamayim, destroyed 120,000 and took much booty. Actually, he was referring to back with Sennacherib. I misspoke. Verse 20, chapter, verse 21. With these words, he filled them with good courage and made them ready to die for their right rulings, or Torah, and their country. Then he divided his army into four parts. Verse 22. You can see it's these righteous people and why Yahuwah would defend them. Amen. Okay, the ones that are righteous. Because we know there were many that weren't righteous that actually fought with the enemy. Okay? Verse 22, He appointed his brothers also, Simon and Yosef and Johanathan, each to command a division, putting 1,500 men under each. Besides, he appointed Eleazar to read aloud from the set-apart book, okay, so this is stepping, and gave the watchword, help of, El of Elohim. Then leading the first division himself, Yehudas, back, back of us, joined the battle with Nicanor. Verse 24, with the Almighty, or El Shaddai, as their ally, they slew more than 9,000 of the enemy and wounded and disabled most of Nicanor's army and forced them all to flee. So who fought for them? Yahuwah, as always. Verse 25, they captured the money of those who had come to buy them as slaves. After pursuing them for some distance, they were obligated to return because of the hour of was late. For it was the day before the Sabbath. See? The hour was getting late. It was time to stop fighting, okay? Because it was become fortunate on evening of the Sabbath. And for that reason, they did not continue their pursuit. Verse 27, and when they had collected the arms of the enemy and stripped them of their spoils, they kept the Sabbath, Amen. giving the great praise and thanks to Yahuwah who had preserved them for that day and allotted it to them as the beginning of mercy. Verse 28, after the Sabbath, they gave some of the spoils to those who had been tortured and to the widows and orphans and distributed the rest among themselves and their 
children or their sons. When they had done this, they made common supplication or prayer and besought the mercy of Yahuwah to fully re reconcile with his servants. To be fully reconciled with his servants. Verse 30. In, in encounters with the forces of Timothy and Bacchus, and Bacchides, they killed more than 20,000 of them and got possession of some exceedingly high strongholds, places, you know, that they could defend. And they divided it very much plunder, giving to those who had been tortured and to the orphans and widows and also to the aged, shares equally to, uh, to their own. Collecting the arms of the enemy, they stored them all carefully in strategic places and carried the rest of the spoils to Jerusalem. Verse 32, they killed the commander of Timothy's forces, a most unholy or one unrighteous man, and one who had greatly troubled the Yehudim. While they were celebrating the victory in the city of their fathers, they burned those who had set fire to the sacred gates. Catholic, Calisthenians and some others who had fled into one little house, so they received the proper rep repayment for their impiety, for their unrighteousness. Verse 34. <coughs> the thrice or three times accused Nicanor, who had brought the thousand merchants to buy the Yehudim, having been, been humbled with the help of Yahuwah by opponents whom he regarded as the least of the least account took off his splendid uniform and made his way alone like a runaway slave across the country till he reached Antioch having succeeded chiefly in the destruction of his own army verse 36 thus he who had undertaken to secure tribute for the Romans by the capture of the people of Jerusalem, proclaimed that the Yehudim had, had a defender, obviously they knew it was the Most High, and that therefore the Yehudim were in, in vulnerable. They were not vulnerable at all. There was no way you could defeat them because they followed the Torah ordained by Him. Okay. Let's see how long chapter 9 is before I continue. Not very long? Okay. For chapter 9. About that time, as it happened, Antiochus had retreated in disorder from the region of Persia. For he had entered the city called Presopelius and attempted to rob the temples and control the city. Therefore, the, put, the people rushed to the rescue with arms, and Antiochus and his men were defeated. With the result, that Antiochus was put to the flight by the inhabitants and beat a shameful retreat. While he was in Akbatana, news came to him of what had happened to Nicanor and forces of Timothy. Transported with rage, he conceived the idea of turning upon the Yehudim, the injury done by those who had put him to flight so he ordered his charity to drive without, or to drive out, stopping until he completed the journey. But the judgment of the Shamayim, or heavens, rode with him. For in his arrogance, he said, when I get there, I will make Jerusalem a cemetery of the Yehudim. Okay, verse 5. But the all-seeing Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel struck him an un incurable and unseen blow. Wow. As soon as he ceased speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels for which there was no relief. And with sharp internal tortures, verse 6, and that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange afflictions. Yet he did not in any way stop his insolence, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Yehudim 
and giving orders to hurry the journey. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body, just like he did those others. Thus, he who had just been thinking that he could command the waves of the sea, wow, in his superhuman arrogance, and imagining that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance, was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of Elohim made known to all. And so the unrighteous man's body swank, swarmed with worms, and while he was still living in anguish and in pain, his flesh rotted away. And because of his stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. Because of his intolerable stench, no one was able to carry the man who, who a little while before had thought that he could touch the stars of the Shamayim. Then it was that broken in spirit, he began to lose much of his arrogance and to come to his senses under the scourge of Elohim. For he was tortured with pain every moment. Verse 12, And when he could not endure his own stench, he, utterly, he uttered these words, It is right to be subject to Elohim, and no mortal should think that he is equal to Elohim. Verse 13, Then the abominable fellow made a vow to Yahuwah, who would no longer have mercy on him, stating that the set-apart city which he was hurrying to level to the ground and to make a cemetery, he was now declaring to be free. And the Yehudim, whom he had not considered worthy, worth burying, but had planned to throw out with their, with their sons to the beasts, for the birds to pick, he would make all of them equal to citizens of Athens, 16, and the set-apart sanctuary which he had formerly plundered, he would adorn with the finest offerings and the set-apart vessels. He would give back all of them many times over, and the expenses incurred for the sacrifices he would provide from his own revenues. And in addition to all this, he also would become a Yehu, a, 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 a Yehud of the Yehudim. He would convert and would visit every inhabited place to proclaim the power of Elohim. But when his sufferings did not in any way abate, for the judgment of Elohim, he had justly come upon him, who had justly come upon him, the Elohim, he gave up all hope for himself and wrote to the Yehudim the, le the following letter in the form of supplication or prayer. This was its content. Verse 19. To his, wor to his worthy Yehudim, or, or the wor to the worthy citizens, of the Yehudim, Antiochus, their king and general, sends hearty greetings and good wishes for their health and prosperity. If you and your sons or Ben are well and your affairs are as you wish, I am glad, as my hope is in the Shamayim, or in the heavens. I remember with affliction your esteem and goodwill. On my way back from the region of Persia, I suffered an annoying illness. And I have de deemed it necessary to take thought for the general security of all. Verse 22, I do not despair of my condition, for I have good hope of recovering from my illness. But I observed that my father, on the occasions when he made ex expeditions into the upper country, appointed his successor, successor so that if anything un unexpected happened or any unwelcome news came, the people throughout the realm would not be troubled, for they would know to whom the government was left. Moreover, I understand how the princes along the border and the neighbors to my kingdom keep watching for the appointment, the opportunities, and waiting to see what will happen. So I have appointed my son Antiochus to be king, which we read in 1 Maccabees whom I have often entrusted and commend, commended 
to most of you when I hastened or hurried off to the upper provinces. And I have written to him what is written here. I therefore urge and beg you to remember the public and private serv services rendered to you and to maintain your present goodwill, each of you toward me and my son. For I am sure that he will follow my policy and will treat you with moderation and kindness. 28. So the murderer and blasphemer, having endured the most intense suffering, such as he had inflicted on others, came to the end of his life by the most pit pitiable fate among the mountains in a strange land. And Philip, one of his, his couriers, took his body home then fearing the bin of Antiochus, he betook himself to Ptolemy, Philometor in Egypt. We're going to stop there that far. It's close enough. It's five after. Little under an hour, but I'd rather go there than go way over. Start part three in chapter 10. If you haven't yet subscribed to the Philadelphia Assemblies, we implore you to do so. Just please subscribe. Again, remember, it doesn't cost you a penny, and it's anonymous. And if you do subscribe, if you like this video, or whether you subscribe or not, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up on YouTube. That helps our algorithm so that more people will see the video. Okay, so give it a thumbs up on YouTube. And if you really liked it, share it to your Facebook page so others can look at it. Okay, so and hit the notification bell on the way out. And may Yahuwah bless until we meet again.